All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so my name is Jorge, and with me are my group mates, uh, Riley and Risa. Also part of our group are uh, Lindsay, Sitong, uh, Taiwan, and my friend. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm kind of nervous, but now you can see. So, it's actually yeah. Yeah. All right, so, oh, I, I also would like to acknowledge our mentors, Tyler and Matthew from the United States Army Corps of Engineers, and also Harry from the University of Hawaii, who unfortunately is not here today. Okay, so this research is motivated by actually a really tangible problem, which is given different military and civilian operations, we would like to have a boat, for example, cross safely from the deep water zone right here, all the way down to the coast. And so, in this first picture we have right here, in between those two zones, we can see the surf zone lies. And this is the zone in which you can see significant wave activity. Uh, you see a lot of like white foam in there, which is uh, a consequence of a process called wave breaking, which is as the waves get closer to the shore, and you can actually see that better in the second picture, their height starts to increase, and they start to ramp up all this uh, potential energy. After a point that becomes unstable, and the wave has to release that energy somehow. So, as you can imagine, if you're in a boat right here, that can be dangerous, depending on how that wave breaking mechanism goes. We will look into it a little bit further to see uh, how to assess this possible danger. All right, so let's take a closer look at the process of wave breaking. And it actually turns out that we are able to classify uh, wave breaking types in at least four different categories. For the purpose of this study, we're only going to really look at three of them. The one I'm leaving out is the collapsing breaker down here, which is kind of rarer than the other ones. Uh, so we have spilling breakers depicted here. We have plunging breakers. And so, for example, when you think of waves uh, that surfers like, these are the kind of waves we're talking about. And they, they have this like barrel in the middle. Uh, but also, if in terms of like boats or trying to cross the surf zone, they're pretty dangerous because their crests are much higher and then they collapse violently onto the water surface. So that's no good for a boat. Uh, the other two types of waves that I talked about, which are spilling and collapsing, uh, I'm sorry, spilling and surging, those we want to consider as dangerous for boats. So we are really trying to come up with ways to predict when this happens in terms of the boundary conditions for the problem of the, wave, of the wave evolution. That is, what's the wave height, what's the wave period, and also what's the topography of the beach. So you may be wondering, well, why wouldn't we just simulate this wave's evolution using high fidelity numerical solvers, maybe solving the Navier Stokes equations, for example? Well, it turns out that such methods are very slow, and they're also quite sensitive to boundary conditions. So whenever we're talking about boundary conditions, we're specifically interested in the underwater topography, which we call bathymetry. And it turns out that this bathymetry is very hard to measure, and it is constantly changing. So it's really hard to get a good overall picture of what the bathymetry is doing, particularly in beaches that we don't constantly survey. So we're looking for an alternative approach to model the wave breaking types. And a really good alternate to do this is a lower fidelity model using what's called the Irobaran number. Now, the reason this might be good is that using the Irobaran number is not as sensitive to these bathymetry boundary conditions that we're really approximating. So by eliminating the sensitivity, we may be able to create a better prediction in the end. Now the error number takes in a few different parameters. The first is the seafloor slope near the wave's breaking point. And it also takes in the wave height in deep water and the wave length in deep water. Now if you compute the error error number, you'll get a value out. And using this value, you can determine whether we have spilling, plunging, or serving, surging wave types. So the goal of our project was to predict the expected breaking types of waves. And we really were interested in using only imagery data of its surf zone, as well as offshore wave conditions, 
like the period and the wave height. Um, this is of interest to us because for beaches that are often, you know, uh, necessary for army operations, we may not know much about the bathymetry underneath the water. So we need to use information that's readily available for a variety of beaches in order to solve this problem. Um, up at the top here, we see Duck, North Carolina. This is a beach that is very well studied and we have a lot of data from. And we um, also have down here an AWACS sensor, which is used to find the offshore wave height and period information. Additionally, we have these photos on the left. The first, the top here is a Timex image. So on the top, along the top is the beach line, and it goes out to sea as you go farther down. And this image is the average of many samples taken over a 10 minute period put all together. And below we just have the variance. So the average of many samples over 10 minutes and the variance. Um, so our first approach to this was the following. And I'd like to bring your attention to the top row for now. So in the top row here, what we have is we have the wave height and the period. But this wave height and period is on near shore information, um, and we're, we really want the deep shore information. So we need to know the wave height and actually the wave length in the deep shore. In order to go from the near shore height and period to the deep uh, water height and length, we have to use the dispersion relations as well as the uh, conservation of energy flux. Um, these equations come from a process known as shoaling. As a wave gets closer to the shoreline, it starts to feel the bottom um, bathymetry and it affects how the wave moves. Um, so after we calculate these properties of the wave, um, we considered that, okay, we have these properties, but really the waves that are coming to shore are very, like they're variable and we, it's hard to predict exactly, you know, if one wave comes, well, the next wave might be slightly different and slightly different after that. But we actually can use what's called a Rayleigh distribution for the wave height. And with all of this uh, information here, with the L deep and the H deep and the Rayleigh distribution, we can calculate a distribution of ear bearing numbers in order to make a prediction of the breaker type. Thank you. So what Riley just described uh, allows us to calculate the denominator of the ear bearing number. Or we still need to address the problem of we need to find a slope. And so in order to do this, we want to use the imagery data that's available, the timex data and bar data. If you recall briefly, the timex data is just the uh, average of several snapshots taken over a, say, 20 minute time period. So the timex gives you like an average behavior of how waves are breaking. And then there's the bar, which is just the statistical variance of these of this collection of data. Once you have that information, we take uh, apply an image processing method that I will describe in detail on the next slide. But the purpose of this is just to extract where the coastline is and where the wave breaking points are. This can be pretty much automated, as I will describe next. Uh, once we have this, these two uh, red and green lines respectively, we are using a method described on a paper of 2016 by Holman, uh, which proposes a parametrization of the of how the beach of the bathymetry looks like. And in order to do this, what is done is we take a given number of like 1D cuts on the seaboard direction. And on each of those, we propose an underwater topography as follows. We superpose a concave profile, which is known as an equilibrium beach profile, imagine what, well, how would this graph look like if we didn't have like these two little bumps here. And then on top of that, we add a Gaussian perturbation, which explains why we have these bumps here. And the reason why that is done, this uh, generates something called, uh, or tries to represent something called the sandbar, which is, gives you like a, a steep increase in the slope, and that process is what, or the existence of that is what makes the waves break in the end. Like this abrupt change in slope is what ha uh, has the waves breaking. So there's also the question, if you're trying to calculate the slope, uh, of course you can see here, uh, the slopes are variable across the whole curve. So which one is the representative slope to take? We went like from 50 to 100 meters before the breaking point. We could see 
that the slope was pretty much constant, and this was the case for several of the telemetries that we studied. So we just took the tangent line around that point. We actually took the maximum slope uh, in this region right here. This is repeated for the, we wanted 50 regions, uh, like this repites the beach in 50 different regions, so we took 49 cups. So that's done 49 times. Uh, if you have this information and you have the weight height distribution, then you can sample this, say, 10,000 times, for example, get 10,000 different uh, samples for the height, plug them into the Rivera numbers formula along with the slopes that we have, and for each different slice, you get 10,000 different Rivera numbers that you can then uh, sort out into whether they predict spillion, plunge, or surgeon according to the different ranges that we had before. And once you do that, you, you do that, you can interpret these percentages as the probabilities of whether you will see each different type of weight breaking. Moving on, now I would, I would like to explain exactly how do we go about finding the shorelines in the raking wave locations. So I'll bring your attention to this first image. This is the Timex, Timex image I was talking about, which is just sort of, a sort of average. We take the grayscale of it, we take out the colors, and I'm sorry, once that is done, we could see in general that we have like two white stripes. One of those represents the coast, one of those represents uh, where the waves are breaking. This is because of the wave activity in the foaming. So if you look at cuts along the vertical direction, which are represented in the second graph right here, you see two stark peaks in the intensity profile. And so what we're trying to do is basically find those two local maxima. The first one is not too hard to find since it's basically the first uh, abrupt increase in the gradient of the of the graph. However, the second one sometimes can be hard to catch. In particular, this uh, maximum right here is larger than this one right here. So in order to do that, it actually happened a couple of uh, graphs ago in the, in the progression there. So in order to avoid that or to deal with that, we set up an objective function to, in order to find the second point that would reward uh, big heights, but would also punish uh, points that were too close to the shoreline. By doing this, we could prevent catching the same local maximum twice, which was unusual occurrence the first time around. This is done for, say, 1,300 locations for the shore and breaking points. Uh, in the end, we will only need to sample maybe 50 of those to proceed with the rest of the algorithm as we described it. So we've got our pipeline to determine our breaking type from the Herobera number, but one of the questions we still had was, uh, well, is the Herobera, the behavior from the Herobera number predicting what we would see if we were on the beach? So we had one day of data from the beach um, that had both the bathymetry measurements and the offshore data or nearshore data that we needed, the image um, that we used, and uh, manually classified breaking types. So this is the observed bathymetry at that yellow slice of the beach. Um, and our zero point might be a little different because our zero is determined by the top of the image. Um, so you can see the bathymetry is pretty similar to the observed, but it looks like they have, um, the observed bathymetry had a little steeper slope and that would lead to more breaking. Um, but this is kind of neat at the images before and after because you can see where the tide is. Um, mm -hmm. So for that same yellow strip, uh, here's the spilling and plunging behavior that was observed. Remember, we want to predict the probability of plunging so the boats can avoid that. So the observations showed about 50% plunging during this time period. For our times that we had all the data that we needed for our pipeline, it was, oh, it was before and after this time period. And you can see the probabilities of plunging that we predicted for that yellow strip of beach. Um, there was a low probability of plunging afterward predicted by our model, and a little bit of plunging predicted before at our model. But since we only have one day of data, 
it's difficult to interpolate, you know, what does this mean for the validation of our method? But, um, but it still is really cool that we can get predictive plunging type from the image of the seafoam, the data from the buoy, or the um, AWAC, um, the observed wave height distribution. Um, but what would be even cooler is if we could do that really fast and have a tool available online for people to use if they wanted to know the safe way to go to the beach. So we decided to try to train some machine learning methods to replicate our direct approach. So our machine learning uh, algorithms had 11 inputs. We had the data from the near shore and we had um, nine points of uh, nine space, three of the y coordinate at three locations, and then x's of the shoreline and x's for the breaking point. That's what we used to determine the error bearing number for each chunk of land on the other one. So we trained three kinds of models random forest, which has been described before, a support vector regression, and a neural network on these 11 uh, inputs for 12,000 rows of data. And so you can see it's a different color scheme. Sorry about that. But for each slice of beach, we have a prediction of the probability of plunging. So the direct method you can see above uh, is predicting plunging on one side of the beach, but not the other. So this is a day for which we have observed bathymetry. We were wondering, is that a reasonable prediction? Wouldn't it be plunging everywhere? But you can see on this day of bathymetry, there's the sandbar on the one side of the beach is very different from the other side of the beach. So it is a reasonable outcome to have plunging in just one local area of the shoreline. So if you were a duck and you wanted to go to Duck, North Carolina, uh, and all you have is this aerial image and data from a buoy of the wave behavior in deep water, we could say, the duck should go this way. There's no plunging. We won't tip over. So uh, we had a lot of future work we wanted to do. Is probably the case with all the teams since it was only one week. Um, but I, it would be great if there was more observed breaking types so we could test um, how well the ear barren number, you see only has those three inputs. So predicting the breaking type at the shore, you know, there's probably a lot of things that go into that. Um, it would be also be great since we didn't have images available um, that fit into our pipeline for us to build a model on the images to say, okay, if we get this image, what's likely to be the images between those two time points, right? When we had our time zero and our time X. So building a time series estimation of, uh, of the images would be something that could really help us. Uh, it looked like the random forest and the SDR were the most amenable to this type of training data, but it seemed like none of the models um, were not giving us back the input uh, that we put in. Sorry, that was a little strange. <laughs> but you could use any of these models, or you could use an ensemble of the models to give you a fast prediction based on just the image of sea foam and some readily available offshore data. <laughs> and the casualty here was <laughs> that thunder. I actually I trying to store a lot of image processing data, so it was an actual casualty of the project. <laughs> All right, thank All right. you so much, everyone. Questions.
So this plunging breaker, does it have the same effect, damage effect on different kinds of tools or, or the same effect on all of this? On all the, which, sorry? On the boats. You said boats. Oh, on the boats. Um, no, of course it wouldn't have the same effect on every single boat, but it's just something, if you can imagine, like, the mass of that water and the height of the wave, the amount of force, you know, like someone unfortunately recently died um, from a plunging breaker, just a person on the beach. So it's more force than you might imagine going into this, and so you, you would want to avoid it for many types of things. There's also the thing that if the waves are too high, because there's also the wave height is plays a factor in how dangerous the wave is, and we're not taking that into account here, right? Like a very tall spilling breaker might be dangerous for a boat, for example. But it doesn't have like this. The issue with the plunging breakers is the energy release is all concentrated in a really small uh, instant of time. So we're first trying to account for that factor. And then the model might be further refined uh, by taking a look at the actual wave height and other uh, factors that are a hazard to boats, for example. Yeah. Uh, so the predictions you, you showed us, uh, are these in sample or out of sample? Uh, they're out. They're, yeah. Do we have time for another? Is there another? Yeah, I have a question. I just have a background question. How much does the bathymetry, like the sandbar change from day to day or over time? Yeah, we had some samples of observed bathymetry. Um, and unfortunately, it didn't make a slide in here of the, of the consecutive observed bathymetry. Um, but it, you can kind of imagine the force we were describing with the brain, you know, that, um, it, yeah, the sand, the sand gets, you know, the particle transport of the sand. And so it can change quite rapidly, but we don't have a lot of observed bathymetry data. How they do is they, they just drive the, yeah, that's, that's an example. So they just drive the boat and ping the bottom is one way that you measure the seafloor, but as you can imagine, it's not super easy because it's not, it's not clear. So you can't fly a drone over or something. These, these two graphs represent the change in our calculated bathymetry uh, over a 20 hour period. So as you can see, there's a, at least two factors. First of all, there's the tide, which actually moves the coast a little bit further in. And yeah, you can see there's a significant like out of phasing and yeah, whatnot. That's really interesting. Yeah, when we first started the project, we thought they'd be you know, relatively constant, but it turns out they can change in a matter of hours. And even less if the waves are huge. Thank you for your question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on your last slide, mm -hmm. uh, when you showed the results, I think, of the instrument, do you, do you have any sort of explanation for the sharp divide between <laughs> predicting plungers at the south end of the region and not at the north end? We do. Um, well, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I'll go ahead. So, I mean, if you look at the bathymetry, it's, so I guess I'll go about this in a little bit of a roundabout way. First of all, let's look at the bathymetry. You can see it's really different from here to here, right? Uh, it looks kind of uniform here, and I would argue that the slopes here are not as uh, pronounced, and that's why the irreverent number is giving us the small predictions. But that doesn't really answer the question, because why is the bathymetry so different from here to here? And a simple answer to that is, this is data from uh, a base in North Carolina, in which there's a huge pier right here in the middle, which I would say kind of has the two sides of the beach be incommunicated a little bit. And so that's why that might be a reason why you're seeing so different bathymetries from one half to the other. But, but can, at, yeah, oh, sorry, but you can see here there's a lot of splashing over here, right? And there's zero splashing over here. 
So, um, well, there's some little right there, but along the rest of the coastline. So, um, so does that answer your question? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, comments on it. Yeah, I can just real quick add, but we see meters of change, and the type of meter is horizontal change with the sand as opposed to owls sometimes. So that's on the natural beach. And the army loves to stick gears and things like that, like the temporary gears that have been changing and further. So it's it's a big deal to be able to track this thing. But this group was was awesome. They were they were they worked really hard. They were great sports. I don't know if you can tell, but there's a lot of terminology and a lot of just weird things that you've never been around when you pick up a project like this and then let alone to try and add some of your own analysis to it in the process. And this group was just we went at it hard from the beginning. We worked really hard. We had a lot of fun. We were loud and, and, and we just always to be a great group and we did really work hard. But, but I'm pretty proud of what they did and I'm excited to see it forward. All right, thank you. Thank you.